for joining us today. Hey, uh, thank you so much for having me. It is uh, great to be here with all of you this afternoon. Um, I, I know you guys are from all across North Carolina. Um, it, it is a gorgeous day outside here in Apex, North Carolina, so I will definitely try not to go over, and I hope you all have a chance to get outside. It's beautiful. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and uh, I do have some slides. Uh, do feel free to, um, to throw a question in the chat. Um, and Amelia can stop me if need be, uh, which is absolutely fine. A uh, lot of information I want to cover today. Um, and uh, I, I've been told that sometimes listening to me speak can be a bit like a drinking from a fire hose. So in terms of information, uh, you won't leave thirsty, but you may get a little wet. So I'm always happy to go back and answer any questions. Um, and then we will have some time at the end for questions as well. So um, going ahead and moving on. Um, uh, like I said, really glad to be here with NC Live today. Um, first big question I get, yes, it is pronounced McGacky. No, I don't understand why that is. I have no explanation for that. Um, but if Brett Favre can get away with it, then so can I. So um, that's about all I can really say uh, on my name. Uh, I am the Executive Director of Arts North Carolina. Um, I, I actually um, have been in North Carolina now for pretty much my entire adult life. I, would, I am a graduate of uh, what is now called UNC School of the Arts, um, where I studied lighting design. So I don't have a political science major or anything. Um, I came up as a lighting designer, as an artist. Uh, and it just so happened that after a brief stint making balloon animals at Harrods Department Store in London, I found myself as the lighting designer for Charlotte Ballet. Uh, I then ended up being director of operations there uh, before moving to the Raleigh area to be the executive director of Charlotte, Charlotte Ballet, or Carolina Ballet, excuse me, in Raleigh. And uh, did that for about five years and got involved with Arts North Carolina as an advocacy organization um, because there were many things going on at the legislature. And I found myself on the board of Arts North Carolina, which, uh, and then when um, when Karen Wells, who was the executive director here for 17 years, um, told me she was going to retire, she said, you should throw your hat in the ring for this. And, and uh, I did, and it just so happened that um, that worked out well for me. Oddly enough, in her retirement, she's actually gone back to work as the uh, as the head of the Durham Library Foundation. Um, so she's actually left this position and then ended up going on to libraries. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Arts North Carolina and who we are and what we do so you have an understanding um, of, of our work and our role in the arts ecosystem. Um, and then I'm, uh, once we talk about, about what we do specifically, I'm going to talk about advocacy in general and not necessarily, obviously a lot of my experiences are advocacy to local, state, and federal government, but we're going to talk about advocacy more in the abstract because um, it could be government officials or it could be your boss or it could be uh, really anyone. And so we're going to kind of work through that. And just cover some techniques that might be useful to you as you um, as you do your own advocacy uh, and move through that. So um, Arts North Carolina, we have a mission of uniting people and communities to strengthen and celebrate a creative North Carolina um, and a vision of a vibrant North Carolina where the arts are embraced by all is indispensable. You could read that mission and vision over and over again and not really understand what we do. Um, really, we do focus on two main things, advancing public funding and policy for nonprofit arts organizations, though recently with the pandemic, we've expanded into the broader creative uh, businesses, creative workers, creative economy, et cetera, um, and also uh, public advancing public funding and policy for comprehensive arts education. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we mean by comprehensive arts education and, and how that equates to our policy stance. Um, we are a 501c3 organization um, and, and function that way. A lot of advocacy organizations might be founded as a 501c4, or actually some have both a 501c3 arm and a 501c4 arm. C4s can do things um, a little differently. They can spend more money on lobbying. Uh, they can endorse candidates. They can give money directly to candidates and things of that nature. Um, we function fine as a 501c3 and it, and it works for our needs. So um, we are North Carolina's only statewide advocacy organization for the arts. 
um, and we support ourselves. And I think it's really important when you're looking at any organization and the work that they do in order to understand their priorities, you kind of have to look at their funding. Um, and about 45% of our funding comes from uh, organization memberships, almost entirely of nonprofit arts organizations. So uh, so really that's, that's a goal number one is advancing policy and funding for those organizations because that's where we receive the bulk of uh, the biggest piece um, is through memberships, uh, but also about 15% through individual donations as well. Many of our donors actually have been affiliated with nonprofit arts organizations as well. Um, we also have the Creative State license plate. You guys uh, uh, may have seen those. It has like arts, uh, North Car arts, North Carolina on it. It's kind of our happy um, little logo guy there you can see in the middle. Um, the fun thing about those, uh, and I'll, I'll give you more information about that later, uh, it's $30 a year to have one, shows everybody that you love and support the arts. Um, you can, it takes about five minutes to order it with a credit card and your registration. Uh, you pay 30 bucks the first time, and then you just pay it with your registration every year. Of that $30, $10 goes to the state of North Carolina, where they use it for the nefarious big government purpose of putting wildflowers on the side of the road. The other $20 comes to Arts North Carolina, and that is how we afford a professional lobbyist. Um, so there, there's someone talking about arts and arts education uh, at the North Carolina General Assembly all year. And then and I will talk a little bit more about Arts Day, but Arts Day is our annual um, conference uh, of art and action. Um, it's actually a two-day conference. We have a, a conference day where we have um, it's the only multidisciplinary arts uh, conference across the entire state. We've got some inspiration, information, talk about advocacy and our agenda, um, as well as some professional development in the arts. Um, and then day two, we go to the, the General Assembly. We have a tent and performances out there. Uh, but then we have probably about 350 to 400 advocates taking about 100 meetings uh, with the with their representatives at the General Assembly. So that's our big advocacy event. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, also, uh, you know, we get a lot of sponsorships from those um, nonprofit arts organizations in addition to memberships. So about two thirds of our funding comes from nonprofit arts organizations. So kind of diving in a little bit to advocacy definitions. Um, what is advocacy, really? I mean, it's pretty basic. Advocacy is support for a cause or idea, be that a policy or a position or a person, et cetera. Um, and it's communication in support of that cause or idea or person, et cetera. Um, but, but there is a difference, particularly from a legal standing of advocacy and lobbying, uh, whereas lobbying is specific action to influence a policy position, person, et cetera. Um, so it really is, uh, it, it's, it's, so both of them need to be there working together um, in order to move one's agenda forward. Um, I will say um, that, so if you're, say, say you want more funding for your county library system, um, talking about why it's important to have libraries in the community, uh, talking about the role that they serve, talking about how they, um, the, the services provided to the community, um, all of that is advocacy, saying here are the reasons that we need 10 million more dollars for our county library system. That is lobbying. So that's the difference. So you have to have both in order to be effective. And we'll dive a little bit more into that. Um, I often get questions about activism and where that falls in the spectrum. Technically, the definition of acti activism is vigorous campaigning for policy positions, et cetera. Um, you know, I tend to stay away from the term adv uh, activist when describing myself and the work that I do because it has a negative connotation. Um, oftentimes, activists are, you know, doing protests or uh, spray painting for coats or or doing things that kind of make other people uncomfortable, and and sometimes they get have a negative connotation in how that's. Um, Put forward. Uh, Betty White is huge, always defined herself as a as an as an advocate, and always corrected anybody that called her an activist, kind of for that same reason. But um, but that's sort of what where it falls in the spectrum of advocacy and lobbying. Um, so when we're doing when the the three things that we focus on primarily with our advocacy and lobbying working together is uh, our grassroots initiative. 
Um, and this is really connecting um, people to their elected officials. So a lot of that of our work in advocacy is in government at the local state and federal level that we do most of our work directly at the state level. I also represent things at the federal level um, and do a lot of training at the local level and provide resources they need um, so that advocates can advocate for their programs um, more directly. Uh, we got a network of hundreds of organizations in our membership, as well as thousands of advocates um, that, that connect through our email list, uh, where we send out calls to action in addition to information um, and that, that folks need to know about what's going on in the arts ecosystem, uh, particularly as it relates to government. Um, additionally, we, as I mentioned, we hire uh, professional lobbyists, Ken Melton and Associates, uh, Ken Melton being the lead, uh, also Andy Chase and, and Sherry Melton. So we've got three registered lobbyists who are over there talking about our issues uh, at, at the North Carolina General Assembly. It allows me the time to be here talking to folks like you. Um, and then we also do election engagement. Um, and so we do that um, by making sure that voters are engaged and that the arts community has all of the information that they need. Um, we help with resources in local communities, um, training to make sure that um, so the arts in local communities are engaging in, um, in, in elections and engaging candidates before they take office uh, through candidate surveys, candidate events. Um, and we've actually done a lot of work with um, seeing uh, candidate events and actually forums, um, uh, candidate forums specific to arts and arts education in communities happening across the state. So uh, excited about that work as well. Now, I said I was gonna talk a little bit about comprehensive arts education um, and what we mean by that. Um, we, we separate that into kind of a three-legged stool that you need these three pieces to really have a, a full arts education piece. There's arts education, which is what you think of as arts education, learning how to dance, learning how to paint and draw and sculpt, learning how to act and um, work on stage, uh, learning how to play an instrument or sing. That's the, that straight up arts education piece offered in many schools and many programs, nonprofit programs as well. Then there's arts exposure. And that's the idea that you really need to be able to go to a museum or a symphony concert or have those, um, those opportunities come into schools and that students uh, and, and really all of us as a, as an arts patron need to have be exposed to the art and not just have instruction, but there needs to be a, a, a higher level of access. So that's an important part of that. Um, and lastly, arts integration. Um, and that is actually a really successful strategy for educating students across the entire uh, curriculum, um, using arts as a tool and a catalyst for that learning. And when folks are like, that doesn't make any sense, that obviously doesn't work. I was like, you learned your ABCs to a song written by Mozart. So why can't you use creative movement to learn how the solar system works, et cetera, et cetera. And we all learn in very different ways and arts integration studies, actually here in North Carolina, we have A plus schools of North Carolina that specifically delve into this work as well. So, um, and we support state funding for those folks as well because they're part of the North Carolina Arts Council. Um, but when we get into the work that Arts North Carolina does in terms of that public funding for and uh, the work to advance public funding and policy for nonprofit arts organizations, um, like I said, a big a bulk of what we do is to advocate to the North Carolina General Assembly um, so that they can provide funding to the North Carolina Arts Council. Now, the North Carolina Arts Council right now receives about $7.3 million um, annually uh, from the General Assembly, um, as well as some other funding they get from the federal government. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they distribute that in a variety of different grant programs uh, all across to all 100 counties of North Carolina. So we partner closely with the North Carolina Arts Council and really advocate for their programs and their grants because they support arts in every single county of the state of North Carolina. Um, additionally, we work with national partners like Americans for the Arts and, uh, and a lot of other folks at the national level um, to, to work directly with Congress. So we have conversations usually uh, at least once a year with um, members of uh, congressional delegation and their staff. Um, usually primarily talking about funding for the National Endowment for the Arts, but also National Endowment for the Humanities, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, et cetera. 
Um, specifically, uh, about a million dollars annually, I think it might be $1.1 million now, goes to the North Carolina Arts Council that then gets redistributed out across the state. And then between 500,000 and a million um, go out to direct grants to uh, throughout the state of North Carolina as well. Um, additionally, how this works for education, very, very similar. Um, we, we talking to the General Assembly, talking to Congress, only those policies are generally enacted by um, the Department of Public Instruction in North Carolina or the U.S. Department of Education. Um, so, but there are certain funding and programs and grant programs as well as um, policies. Uh, most recently, back in 2020, after 10 years of work, we were able to get the arts high school graduation uh, passed. Um, it was not easy, uh, but we finally got there and got that one across the finish line. So you now need one credit uh, in either uh, six through grade six through 12 uh, in, in the arts in order to graduate from high school. Uh, and we're working on some new initiatives in this session as well. Um, so I said I'd talk a little bit more about Arts Day. Um, if, if you guys are, are interested in getting more engaged in the arts, this is a really great way to kind of see what Arts North Carolina is all about. Um, we are in person this year. Uh, we had some hybrid advocacy events in years past, but we are completely back. We do our big conference at the McKimmon Center this year, uh, which is at NC State in Raleigh. Um, and then day two, we're going to be on Halifax Mall, which is the grassy area right there in the middle of the state government complex, right by the legislature. Uh, we're super excited about our lineup. Ben Folds is going to come and, um, and talk to us about a program that he started with the North Carolina Arts Foundation and the North Carolina Arts Council called Keys for Kids. Um, he's also going to tickle the ivories a little bit and sing for us, um, as well as Reese Palmer, Alan Brown, who had, knows a lot about audience development um, and did a lot of research during the pandemic is gonna talk. So there's some professional development. Uh, he, Jeff Bell, head of the North Carolina Arts Council, Nora Helm Hammonds, who runs the, uh, the North Carolina Central University teaching artist um, program. So we're really excited about our speakers. And then legislative day, like I said, folks coming out having those meetings all day long. We have county captains from uh, particularly the larger counties so that there's somebody that's sort of helping to coordinate those meetings and lead those meetings. So it's a good, uh, so if it's your first time doing some kind of advocacy day, we've got some folks there to help you out. We've got full scholarships that are available for um, independent artists, students, and educators, uh, as well as some new accessibility initiatives that we're really excited about kind of leaning into that. So what does all this mean? What is what has Nate been up to for the last several years, right? Like what, what does that look like? Um, so some things that we were able to see, uh, grassroots arts program, which goes, which is one of those programs that goes to all 100 counties. We saw $1 million increase um, that's now recurring uh, in the last fiscal year. So that's 2.8 to 3.8, which takes us up to the, from 6.3 to $7.3 million annually. So that was a really big win for us. Hadn't seen that recurring funding in a while. Um, $15 million in um, funding for from ARPA, from federal dollars that were given to the state, uh, as well as 9.4 million back when the CARES Act came out. So back in 2020, we saw that 9.4 million um, for re COVID relief for the arts, and then another 15 million. Um, I mentioned we were able to pass that arts high school graduation requirement in 2020, uh, worked a lot with the Cooper administration, Department of Health, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, as well as the, um, the governor's legal office, particularly around having those conversations about reopening and how that was gonna happen and all the executive orders. Um, uh, like I said, we also provide a lot of training, how to uh, survey candidates about the arts, how to have events um, for candidates about the arts. Um, we, we have uh, expansive um, work with the Arts North Carolina um, or the North Carolina Arts Education Leadership Coalition, which is basically a group of all the professional or organization of all the professional organizations that represent arts educators. Um, and we work with them around several advocacy things, um, including arts are education resolutions. Um, these are education, these are resolutions that can get be passed by school boards. Uh, to commit themselves to supporting and advancing the arts. Um, and right now, 28% of the public school students in North Carolina 
are covered under one of these resolutions. And so we're trying to get the that number up to 100% as we move forward, as well as um, working with local education agencies and local, um, local arts funding agencies to access the federal funding that came out of the pandemic. Um, we also got we were really involved in um, some major increases in NEA and NEH funding at the federal level. Um, there's been a lot of arts and arts education bills and creative economy bills that have been filed in the last two years. We've seen a real resurgence of that, particularly because we've been working with awareness around the arts and the creative economy throughout the pandemic. Um, and Shuttered Venue Operator Grant was a massive uh, win for, um, you know, because every single venue basically lost all of its revenue all at once during the pandemic. And that was a $16 billion program and um, almost $300 million of that came into North Carolina. So we were uh, very excited to see that. I won't go through all the federal stuff line by line. Um, any questions about Arts North Carolina real quick? Kind of take a breath. Let the fire hose dribble for a second before I dive into advocacy. Okay. Um, so let's see, moving on. So we talked a little bit about advocacy, lobbying, and activism, kind of building on to that list of definitions, um, decision makers. Uh, you know, this is a person or a group of people that have the authority um, over a desired outcome to make a difference on a desired outcome. So as we're going through this, you know, kind of think about some situations that you might be in and who are the decision makers um, in any given situation. Is it your boss? Is it your boss's boss? Is it a board of directors? Is it county commissioners? It can be a lot of different folks for any given situation. Um, communication, and that's really what advocacy is is both speaking and listening and considering new opinions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, also allies, um, you know, allies are folks that have similar goals, folks that we can communicate with um, that are gonna, that, that, or that might communicate our message for us. And we'll talk a little bit more about those folks as well. So in the simplest of equations, you have an advocate or a group of advocates, maybe some of their allies communicating to a decision maker or a group of decision maker, hoping to influence them um, and, and to sway them to their point of view to support their cause. Um, and oh, one, wouldn't it be wonderful if it was always this simple? But of course, there's more tools at our disposals. Um, that may help us to, to kind of make that case. And one of them is influencers. Um, and, you know, I always say, uh, you know, if, if someone wants to influence me, they get my wife to tell me to do it because I usually am smart enough to listen to whatever she tells me to do. Um, but if I want to influence her, I might work to get the kids on my side because, you know, she's, she's a sucker for, you know, for, for them and, and what they want. So, um, you know, in a political spectrum, it could be a politician spouse or it could be um, political donors, et cetera. Um, there's lots of different ways, but obviously we all have people that we trust, people that we listen to. Um, so working as an advocate, working with someone who can influence a decision maker can be just as effective, if not sometimes more effective than communicating with the decision maker directly. Um, which then takes us into public um, opinion, which is also a type of influencer, right? Like, you know, we, we would be lying if we say we don't care what people think of us. And, you know, and, and all decision makers think of that as well. And it, particularly as we think about a broader spectrum, um, public opinion matters to us. So if it is a public issue, if you're able to communicate to the general public and start to shift public opinion, that's going to be a way to influence that decision maker. Obviously, not all of these are right for every situation. Some can very simply be advocating directly to a decision maker, but as what we're trying to accomplish gets more, um, get, gets a little broader and more complex, we have to uh, use more, more of the tools that are at our disposal. And of course, it's nice and easy because there's nobody else advocating for anything else that's out there, but that simply isn't true. There's competing advocates that exist in the space. And usually the, a great example of this is budgets, right? City budget, county budget, state budget. Um, you know, so th there are lots of folks that might, that are, you know, 
advocate they aren't necessarily advocating against the arts per se or or against libraries or whatever it is that you're advocating for but they're advocating for their own so you're in competition um, and i like to think about that like nascar um because you're all trying to move around the track as fast as you can to be the first one to cross the finish line um and and that's all fine and good you have to be aware of the other cars and what they're up to um, but you don't uh, don't necessarily have to worry about them because you're just trying to go as fast as you can. The other reason I like NASCAR is that within NASCAR, there's teams, right? And so that everybody that's owned by the same racing team um, might work together. So that you might not win the race, but by working together, you got you might have three cars from the same team that end in position, say three, five, and six. And if they can get in the top 10, they'll get points and they'll actually end up placing better for the overall season um, and be more successful as a team. So when you're looking at your competing advocates, there might be people or organizations that are out there in the mix that are advocating for something that might be related to or adjacent to you. And there's a possibility to find allies there or at least create some partnerships so that you can work together to achieve your same goals. So there is a, a chance for teamwork. Now, the other piece of that is that there are opposing advocates and opposing advocates, um, we see this, these are all of the issues um, that, that make the news, right? Like these are the ones that we hear about where there's two sides to a debate and there's a for and an against or, um, you know, be that immigration or abortion rights or, um, you know, the, all of those really hot button issues. There's usually two sides and they're in conflict and you, um, into your approach to how you deal with folks that are um, an advocate that is opposing you, all of them have the access to the same influencers, public opinion, um, communication tools that you do. Um, but you, if you're in direct opposition to another advocacy purpose, um, you have to be very aware of the case that they're making because you have to be able to counter it. So that's why we think a little differently between competing advocates and opposing advocates and where we find our synergy. Um, so how do we go about you know, advancing our beliefs. Um, first, and probably the easiest way is messaging. And messaging is one-way communication. Um, that can be an email, a letter, maybe maybe a phone call. Though, obviously, yes, emails, particularly, and phone calls can turn into two-way communication. Um, but a lot of times in, in within grassroots advocacy, you know, folks that sign up to our email list, We'll send out a call to action. It's all set up so it finds your legislators. You just have to hit send and it sends them a message. You don't have to think about it. You might not really end up in a back and forth, but it's it's messaging. It's one-way communication, um, often that first step. Two-way communication, that's a conversation, right? And that's an advocate and a decision maker in dialogue about the issue. Um, so now we're going from presentation to conversation, and that's um, and that's really important because um, there's different things you have to keep in mind. You have to be listening as well as presenting your own case. Um, kind of the next level from the conversation is the relationship, multiple conversations and communication, and you start to build a relationship based on gratitude, friendliness, familiarity, being mutually respectful of one another's ideas and opinions. Um, People you have a relationship, you are more likely to listen to. Um, th this is true of our friends. This is true of our families. Uh, this is also true of our decision makers. So having building those relationships over time will eventually help you to advance your role. Uh, we talked a lot about influencers already. Right here it is. Being able to communicate or message through an influencer um, or relationships using somebody as a go-between, somebody that's already got that level of comfort with the decision maker um, and uh, using that influence. And then the last one that we talked about, public awareness. And um, again, this is a type of influencer, um, but it's using more of a public uh, address. We're talking about emails, going to the news media, radio and television, et cetera, social media, having events to draw awareness to your cause and activism as well. Um, I always tell people to be really cautious whenever you're in, when you go into the public sphere, 
Um, you can make friends really quickly this way, but you also can um, make enemies. Uh, folks that you put a target on your back might think that whatever you're asking for isn't um, isn't worthy of say public funding or whatever. So um, we do have to be a little bit more thoughtful when we go from having a conversation in a room or over an email to having a conversation, you know, on the on the nightly news or messaging um, in news stories and, and larger social media. Um, so that going to that next step, diving into those conversations, because that really is that um, that great way to sort of build up that that advocacy. Um, is having conversations with decision makers, right? Like, again, could be your boss, could be your spouse, could be, uh, could be your parents, um, or could be an elected official. And um, so you got to be ready, right? I mean, this is just like anything else. You want to go in there with some kind of plan. You want to know the who, what, where, why, how, et cetera. Like, this is, um, you know, we, this is how we should really do everything is kind of go in a plan. Um, make sure, particularly when working with government, that you understand the situation, that you understand if you if it's a budget thing, understand how the budget process works, who what what that means. Um, who, you know, is there a committee in the step who's actually making that decision? Um, don't assume that you know already just because you know what you want in the outcome. And that's true of having conversations with your boss and making sure that you try and see things from other people's perspective as well and understand how the system that you're trying to work within um, changes. Um, make sure that you go and you research some facts that support your perspective and your, your position. And we're going to talk a little bit more um, in a bit about how we use those. Um, also, you know, if there's arguments against your position, make sure you're aware of those as well, because you want to be ready with an answer or a, a retort. So it, it helps to have, do a little opposition research and understand, like, if someone is likely to make a case against you, what is that case likely to be? Um, also, and this can be very, very frustrating um, and, and often turns a lot of people off, but getting a meeting is not hard but it is, can be a lengthy process. And that's why I tell people patience, persistence, politeness, and gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. And I, people who listen to me talk and who work with my organization a lot, hear me talk about the attitude of gratitude all the time. Um, it is always important to be grateful before, during, after any interaction you have, um, because it, it, it's a sign of respect. Um, it can take a while to get a meeting, particularly with elected officials or whoever you're talking to, um, but you do want to continue to go at it because if you're asking every single week, can I get a meeting with you, boss? Can I get a meeting with you, whoever that is? Eventually, you're going to get the meeting, but you got to keep your cool in the process because it might take a really long time. Um, also, be, try and be really flexible when you have these meetings, right? Like, be do um, don't insist that the meeting has to happen where and how you want it to happen. Make sure you're you're accommodating the decision maker um, so that they feel comfortable in the space uh, or the means of communication. Um, three things that, that I always, first and foremost, as you kind of build this advocacy um, story or, or making your case is um, share, educate, and ask. And this is a great uh, way to approach this if you're writing an email, if you're speaking in front of city council, if you're having a conversation with your boss, whatever that is, whatever you're trying to advocate for, um, remember, share, educate, and ask. Share. It, usually we're talking about stories, and that might be a story about somebody that you know that helps to make the case that you, you know, how... Um, how arts education uh, helped out a student. Um, you know, I, I always use the example of Little Johnny where Little Johnny struggled in school and um, Little Johnny wasn't coming to class, but then Little Johnny got involved in chorus uh, or band and really enjoyed that and started coming to school more. Little Johnny's grades went up and then Little Johnny went on to be a rock star or Little Johnny went on to be a lawyer, right? But Little Johnny stayed in school. Like there was a positive outcome about Little Johnny who came from a, a, maybe a socioeconomic background that was difficult. Um, maybe it was a, a broken home, whatever that is, but we can connect to Little Johnny and because we're all human. 
right? The decision maker you're talking to is a human being. And when we want to relax, when we want to relate to something, we sit down, we'll watch sitcoms, we'll watch movies, we'll, we'll sit and veg on Netflix because we love stories. We love watching other humans experience things because we understand it. We're hardwired to connect to things through our own humanity. Very few people, maybe there are some, you know, kick back at the end of the day and stare at data on a screen, right? I, maybe there are a few people that really just like, that's how they relax is looking at data. But most people want to, you know, relax and enjoy stories. Um, so now you've got your story, but what's that education piece? That's where the data comes in. That's where you take those pieces of information that we were talking about that really help to make your case to put the story into context. For example, we'll, we can take little Johnny. So um, we, we, we've heard about how little Johnny, but maybe maybe it's just about little Johnny. Really great, great for little Johnny, but how does that affect everybody? Well, you know, if you talk about the fact that um, a student who comes from a low income home is five times less likely to drop out of high school if they are actively involved in the arts in all four years of high school. Um, they're also twice as likely to end up with a, uh, obtaining a college degree and that those that are active, those high school kids that are active in the arts score on average 100 points higher on their SATs. So these are the pieces of information that now takes little Johnny and makes it like every Johnny and every Jane. Um, and so you, by putting that your story, that human connection story into a broader context, that's where, um, that's how you really connect. I will say that in my time um, working in arts advocacy, um, the folks that, that have always really blown me away and completely get this are, um, are the, the young women who participate in pageants. And they, they have, have this sort of, um, of emotion, humanity, facts, like how to make a case. They always come to meetings with legislators or local officials um, in, in a very respectful and polite way. Um, they always present themselves well. They, they have personal stories that then transition into facts um, and, and they really understand this. And um, which was, I, and I have to admit the first time I, I sat down in an advocacy meeting with a pageant winner, I did not know what to expect and was absolutely blown away um, and with some of these the young women. Um, I will say also that none of this means anything if you don't have an ask. And um, you know you can advocate all day long, but this is that little lobbying piece where we are asking for something specific. Um, and it could be funding. Um, it could be uh, it could be a policy. Um, it could be, can we continue this conversation next month? Can we get another meeting? Um, but you're always trying for a yes, obviously. You want them to agree with you. You may settle for a maybe, but if you do that, then follow up with them, right? So that we can try and shift that maybe um, or to be continued. If it's a hard no, it's like, you know, let's, let's agree that maybe we're not going to fix this in this conversation. But hey, let's, let's agree that we can have another conversation because that's what we want to do. Um, other things to keep in mind um, as you're moving through this, listen. Um, and, and I can't say this enough. Um, I, a lot of times, um, I, again, I worked with a, a senator and um, uh, before I had this position, a North Carolina senator. Um, and I, I said, I was like, uh, you know, at the end of our, our first meeting, once I got this position, like, what can I do for you? And she was a Republican senator. And she said, well, let your people know that I support the arts or and let them know that that a lot of my colleagues support the arts, because I feel like there's an assumption that because we're Republicans, we don't support the arts and that there was this partisan divide over the issue of arts. And I'm always the first to admit that there are a lot more Democrats who work in the arts than there are Republicans who work in the arts. It's just a, a fact. Um, so there becomes an assumption amongst arts advocates that Republicans are, are against the arts and Democrats are for them. It's not necessarily true. Republicans just think about funding everything and how the role of government in a very different way than Democrats do. So you have to think about differently about how to have those conversations. Um, so it's always really important to walk in without a preconceived notion of what that decision maker, whoever that is, thinks. Um, 
and but be ready to listen to their point of view. If you disagree, then like be respectful about that, right? Address the disagreement, respond to it, but don't lose your cool. Always be respectful and polite. Keep that high ground. Um, also be ready to adapt, right? Like that's part of listening is it's got to come in the ears, get to the brain and consider their thoughts, you know, and maybe that means like, you know, you've given me something to think about. Can we come back to this meeting later, right? Like maybe your boss makes a point that you hadn't considered. You're like, let's, um, let's come back to this um, and let me think about it some more. So be flexible, be, have a willingness to compromise. It doesn't mean drop your position at the, the, with, at the first sign of resistance, but it does mean that you should be flexible and, and appear uh, and, and put out a, a sense of openness about how you're thinking. Um, and again, and this is, uh, the, like I said, people hear me say it all the time, the attitude of gratitude. It's fun to say because it rhymes, but I cannot stress it enough. Um, be grateful for their time um, before any conversation. At the start of the conversation, thank them for their time. At the end of the conversation, thank them for their time. Um, afterwards, follow up with an email. Thank you notes, just like grandma always said. Those are the best, the nice handwritten um, you know, because especially if it's got a little pretty picture, it'll get received and set on a desk and they'll think about it. Letters work too. They, they might stick around a desk. Emails get deleted, can get deleted really quick. The emails are great ways to share good follow-up information, links to websites, et cetera, attachments, things of that nature. But always, always be grateful because it's a really easy way to show respect to whatever the decision maker you're talking to um, feels. So, Quick follow up. This is my Are You Up for the Art? So if you guys want to get engaged in, you know, Arts North Carolina and everything we do, then um, a few things to think about. Um, first of all, sign up for our email list. That is totally free. And um, and I set it up like maybe you might get an email once a week, but it's set up so you can scroll through it really quick. And if there's nothing there, delete it. So um, please, I encourage all of you to, um, and I think uh, we've got these slides available to you as well. All those links are live. Um, so you can check us out or artsnc.org is our website. Uh, also, join up, um, you know, individual memberships start at $25. Those are our donors. Um, organizations start at $70 and then get bigger um, depending on the size of the organization. Um, but like I talked about, the Creative State license plate is a really great way. First of all, it's a great way to find your car at Trader Joe's or Walmart or Target. And um, it's a very colorful plate. So it helps to make your car pop a little bit. Plus, it's a great way to support the arts and let everybody know that you support the arts. So check that out at thecreativestate.org. Um, and then speak up for the arts or speak up to what's important to you. There's a North Carolina Library Advocacy uh, Organization. I was just looking them up earlier today. Um, you know, find those organizations that can help you sort of uh, st speak up or, or um, be effective speaking up for those causes that are important to you. If it's not Arts North Carolina, I understand, but, you know, do have a conversation um, because that's how, because, you know, the, the best way to change the world is to just have a conversation and to keep having that conversation as best we can. Um, and meeting with elected officials, getting engaged in local advocacy. Um, and then of course, I encourage everybody to come out to Arts Day. Like I said, it's our big event. Um, we got tons of folks, uh, really great performers, including Ben Folds and Racy Palmer. Um, so if you wanna come out and see what that's all about, um, check us out, registration literally opened at nine o'clock this morning. So um, so we are open for business. It's going to be April 17th and 18th this year. So um, I encourage you all to check that out. So you have listened to me yada, yada, yada now for a solid 45 minutes. Um, and so I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, and see if you guys have any questions, if there's anything I can um go into detail a little bit more about or, or just things you might be curious about. And folks, feel free to unmute as well. Um, you can also put them in chat. Oops. Uh, yes, Nate. Yes. Hey, Dan. 
Hi, yeah. Uh, could you uh, just tell us a little bit more about arts integration, this uh, arts across the curriculum? I'm involved in something like that at Campbell University, but I'm just getting started and insights would be quite helpful. Uh, absolutely. I would say um, the first place to go, particularly in North Carolina, is um, A plus schools of North Carolina, okay. um, which is actually um, a, a part of the North Carolina Arts Council. It lives within the North Carolina Arts Council, which is part of the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. So uh, I know the website to um, the Arts Council is ncarts.org. Okay. Uh, and then the, you can you you can navigate to A plus schools from there, or you can just Google um, A plus the letter A, the symbol plus schools of North Carolina, and that'll get you there. Mm -hmm. um, it is I am not an expert, um, so I will I will not pretend to be one. Uh, I will say that that um, A plus schools specifically was created in um, North Carolina. Um, uh, initiated by the Keenan Institute in Winston-Salem, oh. which is affiliated with um, uh, UNC School of the Arts. Uh, and so it kind of started at Keenan. Um, there's a, a good, there's 67 A-plus schools now, several of them in, in Forsyth County in Winston-Salem, because that's where it started, but they're really all over the state. I can't remember how many um, counties um, but they also now exist in um, several other states have started A plus schools programs. Um, I think there's some A plus schools opening in um, was it Sweden, South Africa has some A plus schools program. So it's, it's catching on. Um, unfortunately, it's been a bit of a struggle for us to get the legislature to invest in this particular program. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but that being said, it has thrived under the North Carolina Arts Council because they kind of get it. Um, I will say yes, there um, to talk about that curriculum a little bit, but again, not an expert. Uh, you know, arts are integrated through the course of the day, uh, and really understanding that every student does not learn the same way, and understanding that you know you can present inf information in different ways, the same information in different ways to make sure that everybody's got access to it. Um, the arts are a really great way to, to open pathways, right? Like everybody's hips start swaying when we listen to music, right? Like, you know, like we all feel it. Um, maybe there's a few people that, that don't, but you know, for the most part, like everybody's got some connection to music. So making that connection and learning um, and opening up that part of your brain um, is really useful. Um, there are A-plus fellows uh, that kind of sign on to that program and help to teach that. Um, they've become a leader both in the state and nationally to help develop um, uh, that, that uh, arts integration model um, and provide training for that outside of the A-plus network. Um, so that's that's sort of what that is. I would, I would point you there. They probably have some better speakers and resources to learn about that. Okay. Well, thank you. That's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I had a question. Um, this was a question that was previously submitted on the registration form, but um, actually a couple of folks mentioned like being in positions where they didn't feel particularly powerful within their organization. Um, maybe a, whatever power structures were there, they didn't know that they had that strong voice. So do you have any advice for how to how to handle that sort of power imbalance that you might feel sometimes if you are low on the totem pole, you know, wanting to make a strong ask for something. Right. Um, suggestions there. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, I, I I will say that first of all, I will answer this question in full recognition that I'm a middle aged white guy, which means that there's a lot less barriers to me. So that um, so I try to be respectful of that, um, and that there are. Um, there, there are barriers within systems and within a lot of organizations that are not always equitable. So sometimes you might be going up against situations that aren't, um, and, and that organ a lot of organizations are not structured um, to, to listen and to be equitable. Um, so you can be left feeling very powerless. Um, having that conversation in a respectful way with your supervisor is really important. 
um, and will event can eventually and hopefully should eventually if the people that are running your organization or that are in control are reasonable and are listening if you are patient and keep making this the point in a way that gives them space to not feel attacked right like coming at someone and saying I don't have a voice here. You never listen to me. I'm being oppressed. I'm being minimized. Um, and you need to stop oppressing me or silencing me or give me a greater voice is to a person in authority could be very off-putting, even if they're right. Um, because it because you're not approaching it from a standpoint, you're because they feel attacked, which is going to put them on the defensive. So it has to be, um, so you have to think about how you approach someone more cautiously, um, be that like, um, uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoy being a part of this organization and I want to find out, I, I want to have a conversation about how I can feel like I have um, more agency in how the work gets done. Um, I'm wondering if there's opportunities where my voice can be a part of conversations um, or, or maybe where I can, my ears can be a part of conversation so that I can understand things so that then I might be more able to, to lend my voice to conversations. And I feel like I would be a better employee, say, if we're talking about within an organization, um, if, if, if I could find some ways to respectfully um, you know, help within that, within that process. So you're approaching it as what you're, you're leading into it is like, how can I be a better employee? How can I help you? How can I take the onus of all the work and hassle off the supervisor? Because, you know, somebody wants to be more engaged. And if you come at it from that angle, as opposed to telling them what they're doing wrong, but asking them how you can do something better or how you can help them more effectively, to solve their problems, then that might is a way to kind of get your foot in that door. It doesn't always work. Some people are just closed minded and think very top down. Um, and and that can that can often mean you need to be at a different organization that, that because there are organizations and structures that just are going to work that way, unfortunately. Thank you. Any other questions? You guys are too easy on me. <laughs> or, 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 or maybe everybody except Amelia and Dan is asleep and you guys just turned your cameras off and took a nap. I understand, it, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Thank you very much for for having me and um, and listen to me hammer at you for uh, for an hour. And um, if uh, you know, like I said, the slides are available. I am that guy that's crazy enough to put my email address and my cell phone number on the slides, and I hand them out to everybody because I obviously, I don't know if you can tell, I love yammering about this stuff. Um, so if you have any follow up questions or thoughts or um, or or you're looking for more information. Um, if I don't have the right answer, I will try and point you in the direction of someone who does. So feel free to, to utilize that information. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nate. Thank you all for attending today. Um, I will share the slides, so maybe you'll get a deluge of uh, emails after this. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all so very much. And thanks for Thank all you, you do. Thank you. Take care.